they had the 15th anniversary. And Gene Orley, who is honest as the day is long, soaps don't uh, honor their on anniversary because they last so long. They only, they only go into a big gala and a party and what, every five years. Because if you go every year, then on and on and on, it's no fun. It makes it more special. Okay, they hit the 15th anniversary. And Jean Arley, bless her heart, um, uh, did the same thing that everybody does when they have a 15th anniversary. They celebrate the, the original stars. There were only two original stars left on that show. Ellen Holly and Lillian Heyman. And... Um, we were, uh, Jean Ollie in her honesty, celebrated us as the show's only remaining original stars and we were called up and we had our pictures taken with Tony Thermopolis who had taken over for Fred Silverman and um, uh, the, our pictures were taken by all the press that was standing around for the 15th anniversary while her white stars, all of them who came much later, uh, uh, some 10 years later, uh, the Buch some of the Buchanans uh, came ten years later, nine or ten years later, and all, all of them came later, um, sat by the table and had to watch us get honored for the 15th anniversary. Well, uh, that was uh, a lot of people looked at that, and Agnes Nixon looked at that also, and everybody pretty much decided something had to be done about that. So, um, in very short order, Jean Ollie was gone for having done that. And in came Paul Rausch. And he introduced himself by uh, coming through the door. Uh, I was on the set. And here's this beat-faced person in this cocky suit who comes marching over the wires, stamping across the this set. And he gets up to me and he says, Get that hair off your neck, you the DA! And he turned around and he marched back and I thought, my head said, this can't be happening. And my gut said, you're toast, there go your kids. Because one of the things I planned to do in this heaven I thought I had come back to because of Jean Arley was adopt kids. Hey, you're never gonna get married but you can have kids and you adore kids, you can have a whole house full. Now I realized it was all over. And the reason why I realized it was all over because Joe Stewart had always given me the business behind the closed door of his office. This was a brand new guy who was giving me, going after me in the public square. And there are people standing around who aren't crew, who are uh, actors. He's brand new on the job. There's no way he's going after me the way he did unless he has a mandate from management to do just what he was doing. And sure enough, I went home to that little Park Vendome apartment, took my five-year cab ride. My, you'd think I was Ann Coulter with uh, Alice in Wonderland hair down to my hips the way he was carrying on. My hair was off my neck. He said, get it off your neck. You know, that's where it was. And I went home and I, I couldn't cut my hair fast enough. It was all, it was all very, I ended up looking like Rachel Maddow instead of Ann Coulter. Uh, and it was kind of awful because I was doing it with this. He took one look at me and his face fell. And I couldn't figure out why. And then he found out the way you can get up, what he was looking for was some way to have some kind of abrasive thing going on and I followed his orders. So he came up with, he was very clever, he came up with a thing that he could attack me for that I couldn't do anything about because you can't fix what isn't broken. He told me, you go to a voice teacher and you change that voice. That voice is an offense to the public that you'd be taken off the air. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I had, when I played Marguerite Goche, and Kamino Real, and this is obscene, I can quote some of my reviews, <laughs> word for word, comma for comma. When I played uh, Marguerite Gauthier for Michael Kahn uh, in, um, in, in Kamino Real, and that's the way it's pronounced, it's not Camino Real, it's the, it's the American Kamino Real. The critics had said, 
Alan Holly is a beautiful chameleon, spelled C-A-M-I-L-L-E-A-N, like Camille. Alan Holly is a beautiful chameleon, Marguerite, and how exciting she makes her acting. Her voice is as thrilling as Irene Wirth's. Her movements have the grace and flow of a dancer. Her range covers, and on and on he goes about all the things I can do. When somebody compares you to Irene Wirth, who is one of the great ladies of the British stage, your voice, uh, you don't have to go to a voice teacher because you have a voice. And I had been offending the public for 17 years. <laughs> it wasn't the emergency. He was pretending it was every time he saw me, when are you going to get yourself to a voice teacher and change that? Both producers, David Pressman, Michael, uh, 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 Peter Fine, Minor, Peter Minor, both, they were both told to keep after her, to change that voice. And they were horrified. They, David wouldn't even talk about it. David, uh, David said uh, um, uh, to me, uh, I, I'm not going to talk about that. That's ridiculous. They refused absolutely to do it. Peter Miner was much more concerned about what it was doing to me to be hit and hit and hit and hit and hit with this day after day after to change that voice. You get to a voice teacher. So he said, look, look, he handed me the card of a voice teacher. He said, why don't you start work with her? If you obey him, what can he do to you? So I called her up. She said, I can't hear anything in your voice. What's supposed to be wrong with it? And so she said, well, I said, I don't know. He won't say. She said, ask him. So I um, at one day at the coffee and I said, uh, I'm starting with a voice teacher, but she wants to know uh, what uh, you want. He, he said, I can't, and this is an exact quote, I can't put my finger on it, but you better do something about it and then turns on me and disappears. And nothing could be more ridiculous. Uh, so, you know, David had said, what could she, she, he do to you? Uh, uh, 7 a.m., uh, called out of makeup. Uh, my uh, c contract was almost over. 7 a.m., this is, this is how sadistic he was. He could have told me this at the end of the day. 7 a.m., he calls me out of makeup. I'm looking like uh, the bride of Frankenstein with my hair all up in curlers and feeling like, and I sit down in the chair, and he says, when your contract's up, we're dropping you. You're just not worth keeping. And it's always a blow, but um, when I thought I could stand up and keep my uh, uh, straight, I stood up. It took a moment for me to be sure I wasn't going to fall down. I said, I see. Thank you. And I left. I wasn't about to give a sadist an orgasm by begging for my job.